All right, folks, welcome back. Today, I want to look at an essay by Sir Tony Hoare that asks the question, how did software get so reliable without proof? Now, this is a really provocative title, in my opinion, because Tony Hoare's life's work was dedicated to programming language methodology, formalizing programming languages, and coming up with ways to prove programs correct, and doing that in the most rigorous and formal way possible. But this essay is a very pragmatic and realistic look at the state of software engineering today and how the various practices and methodologies used in software engineering lead to pretty reliable software overall. This essay was written back in 1996, but all its arguments are still very much true today, if not more so. From the very founding of the entire field of computer science, as well as software engineering, there was a sizable camp of, let's call them software Malthusians, who were always predicting doom for the reliability and dependability of software as developed by current methodologies and specifically without formal proofs. As software began to be used in more areas of our daily lives and even in safety critical systems, a lot of research was directed towards mathematically proving programs correct. In fact, this has been kind of a holy grail for the entire field of computer science since its very beginning. Hoare, on the other hand, is asking us to step back and calm down. He points to a survey that shows that of the several thousand deaths that can be attributed to some sort of computer system, only about 10 can be directly linked back to actual errors in software itself. And of those, most of them were due to one specific instance of a radiation machine giving massive overdoses. He doesn't mention it here by name, but I think he's referring to the TRAC-25. On the other hand, Hoare points to real-time software systems whose complexity is measured in tens of millions of lines of code and that get thousands of updates per year working reliably and without incident. And there are several other domains such as aircraft as well as compilers and operating systems that have the same order of magnitude of complexity in terms of lines of code and are yet fairly reliable in day-to-day -day life. However, pretty much none of all this software was actually taken through a formal verification or a formal proof process. So on balance, the software Malthusians seem to have been proven wrong. And Hoare in this essay tries to dive deeper into why that is. In order to understand why software produced even without formal proof ends up being reliable, we have to take a look at the day-to-day -day processes that are followed by people that develop software in an industrial setting. The very first thing we have to look at is how a software process is managed. Even if not formalized, we have by now in practice developed a fairly deep body of knowledge which guides us in how to plan and manage and deliver software. The holy grail of software engineering since its very inception was to make the development of software very much like the development of any other industrial good, to make it like an assembly line process. And while I don't think we are exactly there yet, we are still able to plan and build and deliver fairly large and complex software systems within manageable timeframes. We know, for example, that it pays to spend a lot of effort upfront to make requirements clear. We know that we have to pay special attention 
when we're going from requirements to the initial specification of a program. We know that problems and errors early in the design phase, early in the specification phase, will be the most difficult and most costly to correct. We know that reviews, not only of code, but also of designs and requirements, are a very effective way to achieve reliable results. We know that even if we don't have very strict or formal mathematical proofs, informal reasoning about the program and its specification and its effects still goes a long way towards reasoning about it and talking about it and trying to convince ourselves and others that it does what it is supposed to do. We know that a deep understanding of the domain as well as of the organization that is developing the code also help a lot. So over time, we have built a body of knowledge in terms of managing the software development process that helps us build more reliable software. The next big thing is testing. This is a practice that software has lifted from industrial production, which relies on testing at all steps of the production process to try and minimize defects. Now, Hoar acknowledges the objections of purists such as Dijkstra, who is famous for having said that testing can only reveal the presence of bugs and never their absence and that no matter how much you test a program that cannot give you the same level of confidence in it as formally proving its correctness. But Hoare points out that the goal of testing is not so much to test the product itself, but rather the methods or the process that is used to make it. In some sense, Hoare is saying that Tests are directed not to the program, but to the programmer. The idea is that whenever you find failures in testing, you must re-examine your entire production process. This is going to sound familiar because it is very similar to the Toyota production principles. Hoare also talks about a kind of testing Darwinism over here, which I found somewhat amusing. He's suggesting that in addition to detecting bugs in the code, tests also test the concentration and skills of the programmer. And programmers who consistently fail tests or who cannot write well-tested code are quickly assigned to less intellectually demanding tasks. So once we've done a lot of testing and actually released our code, what next? The next thing we do a lot of is debugging because debugging catches all the defects that testing didn't. We get bug reports in production and we go back and try to find their root cause and fix it. And of course, at this late stage, it is very expensive to fix. However, this is a good alignment of incentives because the perpetrator pays the cost of debugging rather than the customer. A good example of this from recent memory is the famous Pentium bug in the Intel Pentium chip that produced incorrect numerical answers in some cases. This led to a large and very costly recall of Intel's chips, but more importantly, it led to a lot of deep changes inside Intel in their process of developing and testing. Next, Hoare talks about over-engineering. Now, what does he mean by this? He makes the analogy to what we do in civil engineering, for example, where we build structures or bridges and so on to withstand loads many, many times larger than what they would usually be expected to carry. 
he relates this idea back to programming and system design where we can follow various techniques that make it so that a program is able to withstand much more than what it was originally planned for. So one way to over-engineer in software is to not optimize it or at least not prematurely optimize it. Just try to express your logic in as straightforward a manner as possible and keep its complexity to a minimum. While this might be inefficient, it should reduce the chance of writing bugs. Not just that, hardware is getting cheaper and optimizing compilers are getting better. Now this sounds just like common practice these days because this is how all software is basically written. Another very common programming technique that is related to over-engineering is defensive programming, where we insert checks for what might be very extreme or even unexpected conditions, but we still try to deal with them. You could even think of the Unix principle as an example of this. And the Unix principle is that tools should be permissive in what they accept and strict in what they emit. The next set of practices falls under programming methodology. The best example of this is the wholesale adoption of structured programming. This is how we program today, and it's probably how all programmers today know how to write programs. But Hoare reminds us that there was a time when this was not true. They had to really work hard to convince people to give up writing jumps and go-tos and adopt structured programming. And what finally convinced them was a theorem that said that every program with arbitrary jumps could be rewritten as one that only has structured constructs. Another victory of the theorists was the pretty wide adoption of abstract data types and object-oriented programming and strict types that made it much, much easier to write large programs in a robust manner. Information hiding or scoping of variables is another technique that helps us contain complexity. And all these techniques that Hoar mentioned were solidly grounded in formal logic and mathematics. So this was really a victory for the formalists in computer science. The author compares ALGOL 60, which was developed with a formal semantics in mind, with the COBOL language, which was much more ad hoc. Of course, ALGOL 60 went on to be a huge success, but also hugely influential to pretty much all the languages that came after it, whereas COBOL, as the author says, turned out to be an evolutionary dead end. Hoare takes some satisfaction in the fact that a lot of these practices, while not reaching the ideal of formal proofs, are still rooted in the logic and formalization and mathematics that was done by theorists in computer science. He argues that even though there is about a 20-year gap between theory and practice, that is not a bad thing and actually a sign of a healthy discipline. The reason for that is that cutting-edge research must always be validated and tested and refined before it becomes or before it should become mainstream practice. So that was Sir Tony Hoare's essay that tries to examine how we end up making software so reliable even without formally proving it correct. I hope you enjoyed that and I will see you next time.